as human beings, most of us do not mind minor changes in our lives. If all of a sudden, over here, a new Panera went up, that would be a minor change, and most of us would say, oh, that's okay. We don't mind the minor changes. In fact, my son Josiah and I, we have always loved this one soda called Pitch Black Mountain Dew, and they just re-released it again. And so that was a wonderful change in our lives. Right, Josiah? Right, exactly. But when it comes to bigger changes, that we're not so fond of. If I told you this week some of us were coming to paint the church, and you came and room three was changed from light blue to lighter blue, do you think anybody would really have a problem with that? No. But if you came next Sunday and some zealous Jaguar fans painted the entire sanctuary teal, gold, and black, would that be problematic for some people? Yes, I would think so. It would. Now, God has set up, for some reason, He's arranged the world that it's set up in seasons. Obviously, there's the seasons of winter, spring, summer, and so forth. There's obviously a rainy season or times where it's raining, times when it's sunny, times when it's hot, when it's cold. In Jacksonville, that can be what we call a 48-hour period, right? Right. But there's also political seasons. Every four or eight years, we have a new person overseeing our presidential area. Sports come in seasons, right? Football season is slowly coming to an end. And now we're going to be moving on to basketball or baseball or whatever else people like. In the church, there's even seasons. We came out of the Christmas season, and we're now in the season of... It's the epiphany seasons, but above all, it's called ordinary time, and that's why there's green up on the back wall. It represents kind of the mundane part of life that we just travel through with our Lord. Now, you want to talk about a huge change of season in the Scriptures. John the Baptist has this huge following. As we shared last week, people were coming everywhere. They came in the desert to see him. I mean, can you imagine if I had a ministry where you had to walk like five hours into the desert to come hear me preach and it was packed? That'd be pretty cool, don't you think? And then he would go to the ocean side and the people would go there and wherever he went, people would follow. And then all of a sudden, one day, the season was about to change because Jesus Christ, the Messiah, showed up. And John felt awkward baptizing him, but Jesus said this was the right thing to do. Can you imagine John the Baptist lowering Jesus the Messiah into the water? He comes up, and it says a dove rested upon him in the voice, this is my son, of whom I'm now, who I am well pleased. But what's interesting that people overlook in that moment is that John the Baptist, in that very moment, his ministry ended. It's as if you showed up next week and church was done. No more, church, no, more, uh, no more of our church. No more Christ Church Jacksonville Anglican. No more. Just done. Because the moment that he baptized and raised Christ up and declared him the Messiah, everyone was now led to follow him. Because in every season of our lives, our lives are meant to be lived in such a way that it draws people's attention to him even above ourselves. And it's natural as human beings, for pe we want people to no notice us, people to like us, people to appreciate us, and nothing wrong with that. But that can never become more important than our desire to see others drawn upward to Him. It's fascinating because the next day, John's with two of his closest disciples. These guys must have been the ones who did all the prep work, did everything John asked. And it says the next day John was there again with two of his disciples. Do you know who these disciples we find out were? They were Andrew and John. Good try. See, it's good you're at the second service too, so you're getting this. Okay. Yeah, Andrew and John, who later would become disciples of who? Jesus, right? And so in this very moment, that's about to happen. So two of his best men, He's walking with them, and they see Jesus. And John's immediate statement is, look, it's the Lamb of God. And when God is moving you and I into any new season in life, any new set of circumstances, and a new season can happen at any moment, Tragedy can strike. Something can happen to our bodies. Good seasons can happen too. All of a sudden a financial windfall happens. Something can happen. But every new season, we are told that we need to guide our attention, first of all, to look at the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. That He must be the foundation of every season we go through. And that's hard. 
Because I'm sure most of you are like me that when things go bad, the biggest, the first thing we tend to do is just look inward, look at how we can fix it. Oh, woe is me. This is a problem I have to deal with. And God is saying, no, 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 no. You need to look upward because I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the answer to each season I'm walking you through. There, there's a writer who wrote about about 200 some years after Jesus lived. His name was Ephraim of Syrian. I'm sure we've all read his works, right? Just kidding. But he wrote this really neat statement. He said, it was fitting that when the, when the light of the sun appeared, meaning Jesus, the light of the lantern, meaning John the Baptist, would fade away. In other words, remember John's prayer that I would become less and he would become greater? Remember that prayer? That's what was happening at that exact moment. Now, it's interesting because God will take us through unusual circumstances and sets of life. I chose to use King David as an illustration, and you'll see why. Imagine if you're King David. Well, you weren't king at the time. You're just this little run living on a hillside taking care of sheep. That is your job. You're there because all your brothers are doing the important stuff, and you're just hanging out watching the sheep, okay? All of a sudden, you're a shepherd, and in but a moment, a prophet comes and anoints you and tells you what you're going to become, and all of a sudden you're then moved to become the king's musician. I don't know if you remember this, but David went into the king's presence, Eve. But it also said evil spirits would come on Saul, the king, and what would he do to David? He would throw arrow or spears at him. Now, we're not going to implement that practice here at Christ Church with our musicians, okay? That's not something I think we should do. But So he goes from being shepherd to being musician, to becoming a mighty warrior. So mighty that he was leading huge numbers of people. So mighty that people were singing and coming up with songs about his praises. But because of that, the king got jealous and he went from shepherd to musician to warrior. Now isn't God always supposed to move us from better to better to better in our lives, right? That's what, that's what a lot of our modern theology teaches, isn't it? Modern preachers say, God always wants what's best for you. Now that's not true. He only wants what's best for you if your desire is to honor him. Did you catch that? Okay, that, That's a good one. So we might want to write that one down somewhere. He only wants what's best for you if what you want is to honor him. Because if giving you loads of finances is going to pull you away from him, is it right for him to give you that? No, because he knows what's greater for you is to be, related, to be connected to him. And so God takes David, and he becomes this musician, he becomes this warrior, David's feeling good about himself, and all of a sudden, the king gets jealous of David and wants to kill him, and so what does David have to do? He becomes an outlaw, and he's running, and a king is chasing him down, trying to take his life. Now, I, I know all of you pretty well in here. I don't think any of you have ever been chased by a king for threat of your life. Am I right? You've not kept that from me, right? Right? You in the back? No. That's not happened to us physically. But I know every one of us in here has felt like either life or the demonic or anything else has been hunting us down, trying to weigh us down and take us out. And when that is happening in our lives, friends, we have to say, look, the Lamb of God. Look, the Lamb of God. Because He has to be the strength, especially in those types of situations. And so David then goes from outlaw to what? King. And you think, I've arrived. Sometimes in life we feel like I've arrived. I came to Christ Church, the best church in Jacksonville. I said, I've arrived. You know, I'm here. I'm glad to be here. But guess what? After he became king, do you remember what happened next? His son tried to kill him. Drove him out of the kingdom. He ran like, he ran like an outlaw again. So he went from outlaw to king to outlaw. What is God doing? But in the end, God was molding David to be the man that he wanted him to be. And going back to this story in John, after John says, look, the Lamb of God, we read that these two disciples, Andrew and John, heard him say this, and immediately they followed Jesus. Because in each season God is bringing us through, there are hard times and there are wonderful times, but the important thing is that we not only recognize who Jesus is, but we seek to hear his guiding voice in what we do. Because too often we don't hear his guiding voice and we shut ourselves off from it and then we get upset because we've drifted off the path that he wants us to find our purpose on with him. But the good news, friends, is that God is not out to shame us or attack us. He's out to bring us back onto that correct path. 
and we get there by following him and hearing his voice. And Jesus turned around when these guys started following him, and Jesus says to him, what do you want? Now, does anyone think Jesus didn't know what they want? Jesus wasn't caught off guard. He wasn't surprised. He looks back. He sees Andrew. He sees John. What do you want? He asked them this for one reason, not because he was ignorant, because he wanted to give them a chance to put their trust in him. Now, just follow me for a moment, because right after this, Andrew goes and tells his brother Peter, who we all know about, and he brings him along. Can you imagine if they had text messaging back in the Bible? Imagine you are the mother or father of Andrew and Peter, and you get a text from both your boys, and they say, found the Messiah, going to travel with him, love your son. Now, that's problematic, isn't it? Like, I know if, if I got that from one of my kids, I'd be like, hello, what's this? Uh, I'm going to come check this out. But that's exactly what they did. It's how radical it truly was. That just in this moment, they said, I am going to follow Jesus. And that's what they do. They leave behind John the Baptist, and they move forward, and they follow Jesus. And that is how they found their strength for that next season they were moving into as being followers of him. Now, in Psalm 40, we are shown a truth, and that is that it can be really hard to be patient when things are going like crap. <laughs> it just is. When things don't seem to be changing, they don't seem to be turning around, we don't know what's going on, and we cry out to God, and he doesn't seem to answer. And yet David, in his psalm, he addresses this. He says, I had to wait patiently for the Lord. And waiting patiently for the Lord can be one of the most difficult things. I think if we're all honest, we struggle when the fast food line's taking too long at McDonald's, right? And it's, Come on now, let's speed this thing up a little bit, right? And yet God is saying, you'll wait on my timeline, not yours. Isn't that part of making him Lord? That everything's about God's timeline. God will choose to fix or not fix each situation on his timeline because he has big picture life of each of us in his mind. And that's the joy of trusting in God. Remember what the Bible says in, in the Proverbs? It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Not only trust him, but don't lean on your own understanding of things, the way you try to figure them out. But in all your ways, acknowledge him first. And when you do that, when you acknowledge him first and don't trust in your own ways, the Bible says with a promise, he will direct your path. I love verses like that because it doesn't say he may consider whether he feels like directing your path. Wouldn't that be a horrible Bible verse? It would mean nothing to us. So it really means nothing. No, it says he will direct. There are so few things that are certain in our lives and in this world. But one thing that is certain is that when we acknowledge him, we put our own desires aside and we seek him, he will direct us. It may take us time to unplug our ears and hear, but he will direct you and I. And it's wonderful because it says <laughs> that he doesn't favor any person over the other which means because I, I sometimes have my collar on and I, I'm a, a priest in the church, does that mean that he directs me more than he directs you? Of course not. Does that mean that I hear him better than you hear him? Of course not. That each one of us is treated as highly valuable. I remember there was a guitarist who had written on his uh, guitar case, a Christian guitarist, it said, God loves all of us, but I'm his favorite. <laughs> but what's neat about that is it's true, but yet every one of us can write it, isn't it? That, that somehow God works that way. You know, do you have a five favorite child? No, but he's my... I, I heard a parent once say, I don't have a favorite child. I have a favorite child at certain times. Depending <laughs> how they act and what they do. But with God, that's not how it is. We're always his favorite, whether we are obeying and loving him or whether we are disobeying him, we're still his favorite. But he's drawing us in to hear his voice by acknowledging him, friends. In a, a, from a psalm that's very familiar to all of us, and I, I'm in no means going to go through the whole thing. But most of us are familiar with uh, Psalm 23, and we've heard it read at so many funerals. I've done like 25 funerals in my life, and probably half at least have had this psalm. But hear these words in a new, fresh way from what we're talking about. In the season of life you're in, with what you're working through and going through, know that the Lord is your shepherd, the one that guides you. And because of that, 
you will not be in want or you will not lack his guidance. The next verse is, and so he'll make us to lie down in green pastures. That implies a time of patience and waiting. That he forces us because in that waiting period, is it because he's like a masochist and he wants to hurt us? No, it's because he wants us to learn what it is to trust him in life. Because otherwise, we live in this place where there is no trust for him at all. And then it says, he guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. If we know God and we trust in his character, he will guide you and I for his name's sake. And that's all we can really ask of him, isn't it? If we are his, we just ask that he would guide us and direct us. And I know a lot of people, let's just say we're all this way. A lot of times we say, I don't get it. Well, let me ask you, if someone is walking in the right direction, do you have to speak to them to guide them at that moment? No. Sometimes we think God's not speaking, but really, you're doing the right thing, and so he doesn't need to over-engage. He'll wait for you to divert off of that direction, and then he'll bring correction. So sometimes when we say, I just can't hear God, that could actually be a good thing. Have you ever thought about that? Didn't think so. Me neither. It just came to me. No, I bought it before. But, but I think it's really exciting, isn't it? Now, there are times that we don't hear him because we're, we're not listening, but sometimes God's just not speaking because he's appreciating that we're going in the right direction. And so David went through this horrible struggling time, yet he says, I waited patiently for God. So he lifted me out of my darkness. He pulled me out of the mud, and he set my feet on a solid rock. Any of us who have dealt with a high level of anxiety and stress know that it can so infect our bodies, it doesn't just stay in our heads, does it? It can make our whole body feel weak. It can even make your legs feel wobbly if the stress attack is that strong. I won't ask for a testimony of that, but we know it's true. And God is saying, but if you can get to that place where you hear me, if you can get to that solid foundation, I can help lift all of that off of you. It doesn't mean all the circumstances go away, but it means you are triumphant in him in those circumstances. And isn't that a great way to live? The season may not always end when we want it to, but we can be strong in that season. It's what God tells us. And in that place, in this psalm, it says, and then he's going to put a new song in your heart. <laughs> what's, what's that new song? It may not be a song that you want to hear played on uh, K-Love or whatever the Christian radio station is around here. But it's a song that's real between you and him. A declaration of your trust in what he's doing in your life. And that's the kind of new song he wants to put in your heart. And so if we feel like we don't have a new song, let's invite God to do a work that we can then produce a song. Now, I'm almost done. I appreciate you sticking with me. If anyone went through crazy seasons, it was the Apostle Paul, right? I mean, one minute, he's like raising people from the dead, he's healing people, and the next minute, they're throwing stones, knocking him unconscious, and dragging him half dead out of the village. The next minute, he's on a boat as a prisoner tied up and being treated as prisoners get treated. The next minute, God causes a whole giant hurricane to come, and they listen to Paul, and he becomes the captain, and he helps direct them to get to the shore, right? I mean, his whole life, the book of Acts, and you read Paul's life, it's just this giant yo-yo of seasons that are going up and down. One minute, he's preaching to a huge crowd. The next minute, they're rioting and dragging him into prison. I mean, talk about a tough day, right? <laughs> You're feeling good. You grab lunch with everybody. Let's go back out there. What? You know, it's not, it's not, they're coming to get you. That's what Paul went through. And yet, after all of that, at the very end of his life, he was put in prison, most believe in Rome. And he makes this statement to his, his, the one guy he's mentoring, Timothy. Most scholars believe 2 Timothy was the last book Paul had, had written, uh, we have that he wrote. And in the very last chapter of the last book that Paul wrote, he says this, For I am, my life is already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. He knew that he was about to be martyred for the faith in Rome. And he, with that in mind, with that staring him in the face, that final season of life, he says, But I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I have kept the faith. 
Now, anyone who reads Acts knows Paul did not live his life perfectly. He got in arguments with people all the time. He got in a disagreement with Barnabas and probably was wrong. He did things wrong, but within that, he kept fighting and fighting and fighting in the faith of Jesus Christ. And because of that, he can sit back at the end of his life and say, and so I have finished the race, I've kept the faith. And then this last word of confidence. He says, now, there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will reward to me on that day. Wouldn't that be great for us to have that confidence in our life? That it's not just Paul he's talking to, Well, I'm glad you asked that question even though you really didn't ask ask it. Because the very next line Paul says is, and not only for me, but also for all of us who have longed for his appearing and to see him face to face. That that crown of righteousness Paul is talking about is not just for the, the great missionary Paul, one of the great men to walk the earth, but it's for every one of us going through our individual seasons our individual challenges. We don't say uh, we want to go through them, but through Christ we go through them in His strength. And I implore you that as you go through them to let Him be your foundation. I'm really excited because at the end of the uh, month we're going to have a unified service and I'm going to share with you some of the things I think the Lord is bringing us through or into with a new season. And we're going to have a good time talking about that because as He takes each of us through it, as we gather, he takes all of us through it, right? And so please, seek God while he may be found. Trust in him with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding, and he will direct your path. Amen?